welcome to the Mortis Story Podcast. I'm so glad that you have come along for this episode. This is one that when I found out that this book was written, I knew immediately I had to get the author on. And so I'm really glad in a minute here, I'll welcome in Steve Siemens, and it's going to be a helpful conversation for all of us. But I want you to know this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And this summer, we have been overwhelmed by the way that the Global Methodist Church has come to us at Wesley Biblical Seminary after we were an approved institution, and then we started our course of study for people wanting to enter or seek credentials to be ordained ministers in a Global Methodist Church. You might not believe this, but we've added 250 students to our, our, our school here, and we have now, uh, we have 600% growth, and so we are building the ship while it is at sea, but it's an exciting time as we're serving these students who are incredibly hungry, and we have a variety of offerings that we would love for you to consider from a Wesley Institute, which starts just after Labor Day, which is a program that takes people through, one, every book of the Bible and the Bible track, or nine months of theological studies as well. So that's kind of for lay people, Sunday school teachers that we have in mind for that. But then our course of study for the Global Methodist Church, Masters, MDiv, MAs, MDiv, Doctor of Ministry. We'd love for you to think about Wesley Biblical Seminary. You can find out more about us at wbs.edu. And secondly, I'm so thankful to my friend Bill Roberts, who helps sponsor this podcast. He is a financial planner who comes at that from a Christian perspective and really helps people, particularly pastors, think about the way they can approach retirement. That's not something that really I think about very much. And I'm so thankful for people like Bill who can come alongside of people to help people with that. So you can find out more about him at williamhroberts.com. Com. And finally, I want to make sure you know a couple of things are coming from the More to Story podcast. One, I have a free resource available for people. It's called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. I know that sounds a little gimmicky, but I really believe it's true that if we can take time to learn how to read scripture well and to think creatively about how we present it, I think God can use that in your life and in your ministry. So there's a video teaching and then an eight-page document that you can get for free if you sign up for my email list at andymillerthe3rd.com. That's andymillerii.com. And at the end of the month of August, I have a new small group study coming out on heaven. And it's uh, five sessions. We're about a half an hour each with discussion guides. So be on the lookout for that. That might actually be out by the time this podcast comes out. All right. I'm so glad to welcome in my former professor and friend, Dr. Steve Seaman. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's it's great to be with you, Andy. I think I was with you back in February, right? Uh, sort of at That's the end right. of the Asbury outpouring, and we were talking about what God was beginning to do here. And uh, but it's great to be back with you again. Yeah. Oh, and if people might recognize you're sitting in the same seat. And that was a Sunday afternoon. And I was so anxious to want to be a part of the, the revival that I, I just had to find. And I knew you were there and I knew you'd be able to share. So that was a real delight to hear about what, what your experience with that. And also kind of the beautiful way that it, it bookends it, or is a part of like the beginning of your ministry while you were still at in college and then here in retirement mm -hmm. to be able to experience that. Before we go into your book, you know, we're now six months after the outpouring. What, what are you thinking about these days as it relates to what happened there? Well, I think that uh, the Asbury outpouring was a kind of a signal, uh, a sort of a shot heard around the world sort of signal <laughs> to, the, to, to the body of Christ uh, globally, globally, that uh, uh, the Lord is up to something. Mm. And uh, he says, uh, Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. I believe, Andy, that we're uh, in a season and a time when the Lord wants to be found and he yeah. wants to come near. If if we will, you know, humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, he'll show up. And if we'll just simply say, Lord, uh, what do you want to do in my community, my sphere of influence, my life, my congregation, uh, what, do, what do you want to do to bring renewal and awakening? And, we, and we'll sort of live into that. Uh, I believe we'll be amazed and surprised at what will happen. So I think yeah. that's where we are. And uh, that significance of that outpouring, not only to what it did for us 
for, for you know for folks personally and and individually but i think it's it was actually a a message to the whole body of christ yeah and i'm i'm hopeful of that in in and how that connects to your book as well, um, Jesus the Healer. I'm not sure if it's out yet. When, when does it come out, Steve? It actually comes out on the 5th of uh, September. It's a, it's order. It's on Amazon pre-order, that sort of thing now. But yeah, the 5th of September. Uh, so gotcha. just what, three, three more weeks or so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, one of these combined uh, publications from Seedbed and Zondervan. So I'm really thankful for this to come at this time. And it's interesting too. Of course, I, and you helped me think through these type of things when I was in your class, maybe not to be too tribal in the sense of like, all right, we have a Wesleyan voice coming through. It's like, it's bigger than that, but there, there is a Wesleyan accent in a kind of a pan Wesleyan perspective, but there is something about like maybe why God's led to the point of having the outpouring as it is, and even a book on healing, because I'm sad to say that there have been people who, when they just even hear that word, they think, and they maybe push away a little bit. Um, but there might be a way that this comes from the Wesleyan tradition that makes it easier for people across the body of Christ to hear. Um, do you think that there, there might be a connection between that idea and even the recognition of the outpouring? Yeah, I think I I think um, the focus in the outpouring on the holiness of God and just that uh, that that Wesleyan center, that true north, as it were, uh, was very significant. And um, someone even commented on that in an article that he wrote in Christianity Today about the outpouring. And I think um, in in when it comes to healing. Um, we, we, we're sort of, we Wesleyans are, are, are between um, the cessationists over on one side, you know, who are yeah. skittish about healing, and some would even say healing is, you know, was for the first century, but it's, it's not for the present age. Uh, most folks, I think, have pretty much cast that idea away or aside. Yeah. I think um, the, the role of healing in the global church is just so immense and huge and significant that it's kind of hard to be a cessationist today but, <laughs> yeah but, but but what i find is that there are a lot of folks that aren't doctrinally cessationist wow. but, they're, but they're practically cessationist you yes know? They're, still, they're still kind of skittish about healing and yeah we believe that god can heal jesus can heal but we're really not expecting that much in our in in our context so so on the one hand, there's that there's that extreme, and then the other extreme is uh, Pentecostals and Charismatics who have uh, really dived in to healing, and yes. oftentimes are gung ho about healing, but sometimes have uh, gone off the rails a little bit in some of their teaching and some of their understanding of healing, and sometimes gone to an extreme. You might say uh, one group underbelieves and the other group overbelieves, <laughs> and yeah. I really think there's a Wesleyan middle that would call the folks who are skip skeptical to to be more open. Uh, after all, this was one of the three primary things that Jesus did in his ministry: um, preach, taught, and heal. But also uh, on the other side, uh, Charismatics and Pentecostals who I think many of them are actually looking for something that's more balanced and biblically rooted and grounded and uh, that, that, that can help them do that actually more fruitfully and, uh, and helpfully. So I'm hoping that actually this book, Follow the Healer, uh, will sort of serve as a bridge between both of those or in the middle, of, stand in the middle and in, actually just encourage us all to be able to join Jesus in his ongoing ministry of healing in the world today uh, in a more yeah. fruitful uh, way than ever before. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, I hope so. That you, you said something there that uh, it's been an emphasis in your writing and teaching and preaching that I certainly like, I don't know how to say it, Steve, like in the right way. Like I'm one of your, you know, your children in the ministry, so to speak. So you know, people might pick up a, uh, an accent that has Steve Stevens in it, but it, and so I've tried to say this in my own work, but it, you've emphasized the importance of, and this book does it too, 
whose ministry are we talking about here? And and you just you just highlight it, but go ahead and tell, go ahead and help people get this point. I mean, it, it, you know, we have people listening across kind of like denominational perspectives, but a lot of our folks are connected to various seminaries, and you know, we often have my ministry. But wh whose ministry are we talking about? Yeah, you know, I, I, when I came out of seminary, Andy, I I tended to think it was my ministry, and I was offering Christ to them, you know. Right. And about five years into ministry, I came to I came to the realization that actually all authentic Christian ministry is really just a participation in the ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, yes. I tend to think, you know, he had a three year ministry and then he has he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and he's in heaven. And, you know, now the ministry is in our hands. But actually, I think the, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was not only the resurrection of his body, but it was the resurrection of his ministry. Amen. And, yes. and he's only just begun. And now, but now he does it through his body, the church, through us. But it's the ongoing ministry of Jesus. And um, whether you're teaching a course on preaching, preaching is the ongoing preaching ministry of Jesus. Amen. And uh, healing is the ongoing healing ministry. Uh, of Jesus being affected through us. And uh, actually, that is tremendously liberating to know and understand because, in, a, in effect, it takes the burden off of you and me. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's, it's, if it's his ministry, then I join him. Uh, then I quit praying, help me, Lord, to do it right, to Lord, help yourself to me. Mm, amen help yourself yeah. to me take me and use me but affect your ministry in me and through me that is just that is so critical to understand uh if you're in christian ministry that all all your ministry is really joining him and his and uh then it yeah becomes, I, then it becomes an adventure right it's <laughs> it i just preached this morning um at western biblical seminary's chapel and I emphasize, I preached from Psalm 104, and there's an interesting passage, the ESV and the King James Version translate a verse there differently than anybody, than any other translation. It says that, um, that, that God, he, in this point, he rides on the wings of the wind. And this says after he wraps himself in light, I mean, very familiar uh, Psalm, and, but he's, he rides on the wings of the wind, but the ESV um, gives a more wooden translation, and it says, um, he makes his messengers winds. Okay, oh. so the idea here that is oh. like, I think it, it's old, tra other translations you say he makes the wind his messengers, but the idea is that we are the wind that he rides on. Uh, I think that that's what they're is trying to imply. In, in, in that, there's an adventure with this, like we somehow get invited in to his work right and we participate with him in the task that he has in redeeming the world so it's kind of it's kind of amazing uh, that he really wants us to go along for the ride <laughs> 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 and that uh, you know because uh, god really is interested in uh partnership relationship in a uh, partnership in relation you know mm. he wants us to partner with him you know kind of like he says to Adam way back in the garden, well, hey, you name the animals, man. <laughs> and I, 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 But I really think that he that's his desire, you know. Um, he wants us to partner with him. Sometimes yeah. intercessory prayer like, is like that. He, he puts on our hearts the things that he himself longs to do and wants to do. And then we pray the very th into those things, and then they happen. Right. It's, yeah. it's a mystery why he would choose to use us right. and, and how he uses us. But man, I'm so thankful he does. Amen. Amen. You know, if I, so, so fulfilling. At the same time, you know, sometimes people don't, um, this, they might embrace that side of it, maybe in preaching ministry, but maybe not the healing side. And, um, and, and you, you work through, I, I saw a footnote as well, that this, these five ways that God heals. And um, and maybe you could tell us about the source yeah. of that too. I saw I saw that I thought that was interesting that it comes from a few different people. But nevertheless, I think these we might not have time to go over all five. But 
And I think that's a really helpful way to bring people in to the variety of healings that can happen as we enter into Jesus's ministry. Yeah, I heard actually uh, Dr. Frank Stanger, who was the president of Asbury Seminary when I was a student, first talk about the five ways Jesus heals. And uh, I think he may have actually gotten some of those from East Stanley Jones. I'm not exactly sure, but I think that might be the source of them. But it really been helpful to me to understand that Jesus is uh, is is both you know our Creator and our Redeemer, and He's the Lord of Heaven and Earth, and He He works. First of all, He heals directly and supernaturally. When when we think of healing, that's the way we tend to think of Christian healing. But that's just that's one of the ways He heals. But secondly, He He heals through medicine and through doctors. Yes. Um, they here again, this partnership things. I think they're that they don't a lot of them don't realize it, but they're partnering with him. Wow. And, uh, as he heals through medic medical science and doctors. And uh, um, so Nutrition. we should encourage people to go to, to 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 go to physicians and 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 pray for our doctors uh, mm. when we when that God would lead them and guide them as they diagnose us and and as they prescribe things for us and so forth, uh, God heals also through the, the healing powers of the human body. Mm. He's built healing into our system, as it were, you know, our immune system. And, you know, you cut yourself and your blood starts coagulating, you know, and um, it's we are made for healing. And actually, in relation to that, I find sometimes what I do in healing prayer ministry is to try to remove some obstacles, sometimes like things like unforgiveness, bitterness, right. uh, and I could like mention some fear, anxiety. These kinds of things uh, actually keep our bodies from being able to function the way God intended them to sometimes. Mm. Mm. And I've had occasions where when we were able to help this person, let's just say forgive someone, that a physical problem that they had literally just went away on its own wow yeah you know, i've seen that happen but um he he heals through the the healing power of the human body and then there's the the healing power of uh my grace is sufficient for you mm. like he gives paul with his thorn in the flesh uh, that that he enables us to live victoriously sometimes with with afflictions and with things that that won't get healed till heaven, as it were, mm, mm. that we live with, you know. But um, I've known people who have, have have exhibited a great measure of grace in their life. Mm. It's been it's been a it's been astounding and a joy to actually watch them uh, as they live triumphantly and joyfully with with infirmities. And, and 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 things that God doesn't heal. And then lastly, the healing uh, Jesus heals through victorious dying. Wow. As, 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 and, um, and, and speaking of, the, of Wesley, uh, Andy, uh, one of the things I didn't realize at the time when I heard that from Dr. Stanger, but much later on, I, when I went back and studied Wesley himself and his practice, I realized Hey, he had a he had a, actually a a strong emphasis on all five of those, hmm. and they all show up, and so there's that kind of balanced understanding of of healing. And one of the things that actually leads me to conclude is that Jesus actually always wills to heal. So I don't pray, Lord, if it be your will, heal okay. this person, but I just don't know which of these five. Or which combination of this of these five sometimes Jesus wants to use to heal this person. So, you know, it's not a question of if, but how, you might say. Uh, Interesting. And, uh, anyway, that's really helped me. And I think uh, those of us in, in healing ministry need that sort of full or sort of inclusive understanding of the way Jesus heals. Well, I want to, I'm going to just list the five here in a second, and I want to ask you more specifically about the last two. But you know, okay. it's the first one directly, which is like through supernatural healings, right. uh, doctors and medicine, 
uh, using the body as the third, the natural yeah. ways that God heals us, then bestowing grace in difficult right. circumstances, and then victorious dying. So those are the five, just in case people are taking notes. But you know, some might push back on number four. Like, is is that really healing? If yeah. how how can that be healing if somebody's not healed? Like, it's just, no. it's just a grace um, it, that helping somebody just to learn to deal with something. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And I, I understand that. I, I just go back to that passage in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. And he, he, he actually says that uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect wow. in weakness. And Paul, and, and so then Paul says, I boast about this now. I I glory in this, and it seems to me that uh, perfected strength made perfect in yeah. weakness and glorying in our infirmities, that that's a work of healing, and that's wow. a work of grace. You yeah. Know? That's not just, uh, you, you know, managing to sort of hold on. Right. As it were. And so I see that as actually a, a, a form of healing. Yeah. That's helpful. And I think that that's a helpful idea to think about what you just said, not not to make it conditional. If if it be your will, you know, th to right. get us out of jail free card that we're not so worried in case something doesn't work, but that God's healing will come, can come in each right. situation. The, the last one, this is really helpful to me when I read this and I read it in an article version, then in the kind of the, the proof version of the book that you have. Uh, dying grace, the the, the healing yeah. of death. Um, I obviously don't think of that, but if if we were just materialists who didn't believe that there was anything beyond this life or not a resurrection of the body, um, well, maybe we could see how that could, wouldn't be the case. But really, you you go into I, I love this little section of your book about the gift of death uh, that that death is. Uh, I hadn't thought about that too much. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we, we we Americans, uh, th that's one of the taboo things we don't talk about, isn't it? You know, and yeah. uh, uh, we, we, we tend to avoid death, but but actually it's uh, it's it's that which takes us actually into the into the life to come and uh, and and actually prepares us then for the ultimate resurrection of the body. Uh, and um, it's really interesting. The early Methodists really strongly emphasized this. And, and part of this, it actually came out of the Puritan tradition that your, your deathbed was supposed to be a sort of a pulpit. Hmm. That not only, you know, were you uh, supposed to share, to hear loved ones come and sort of say their goodbyes to you, but that you as a, as a believer, you know, as that, as that veil between this world and the next gets real thin. And, you know, yeah. sometimes people when they're dying, they kind of move back and forth a little bit uh, in, in lots of examples of that happening, but that you actually have some things to say to your, to people and to share with people. And, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, John Wesley included in the Arminian magazine accounts of people's victorious dying. They called it happy deaths. Yes. You know? So, uh, yeah, I, I think we need to understand that. And actually, it's something that I don't think we in the American, in the American context have taught people much about or talked much about, you know. And maybe we need to reclaim a little bit too. We sort of turned the, the whole dying process over to sort of a biomedical perspective sure. and framework. And we've lost some of the actually traditional Christian understanding on the uh, art of dying and wow. preparing to die, you know. So anyway, there's a whole oh, that's lot great. to say about that. Well, you know, in, in my tradition, growing up in the Salvation Army, we called uh, when somebody dies, they're promoted to glory. Right. We have this. And then and on top of that, there is this um, you talk about something 
that happens when somebody dies. I think somebody who lived relatively close to you, uh, I just, I don't even know their first names, but the the older Moltons, Colonel Moulton, uh, yes. I think he used to live on the same street as you. Um, when his wife died, she had, you know, had lost her memory, but very close to the end of her death, um, she sang all seven verses of O Boundless Salvation. Oh, wow. <laughs> It just, it, it was like <laughs> this pulpit type of moment. And like, you know, God does give this grace, this deathbed grace, you know, and I, I love the idea of thinking of it as a pulpit and also connected to healing, like this yeah. bigger picture than just the healing that can come in one moment of uh, physical healing. But this is a part of the way that we can continue to pray. Right. I love that. Um, now, one of the things I w- wonder is like, as I think about some churches that are may- maybe responding to the signal call, like we said, that comes from the outpouring. And at the same time, there's, you know, thousands of churches that have disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church, becoming global Methodist or, or partnering with other denominations. And then other people too, are just wanting to be a part of the, they sent something news happening. What would, what could you say to for some of these churches that might want to emphasize healing ministry more, what are some steps that they could take to do this in their churches? Yeah. Uh, well, if I were, if I were a pastor or a part of a leadership team, uh, I think uh, I would encourage them uh, number one, to just spend some, uh, a few months in prayer saying, Lord, is this something you want us to, focus on and emphasize a bit, and then maybe uh, begin to do some things. For example, if you've never, if you've never prayed for, or invited people to come forward and, and maybe be anointed with oil and receive prayer at the end of the service, or uh, sometimes in churches, they'll do it when they have communion Sunday, after the person, folks have received the elements, they can yeah. go over to a, a couple of people, some stations, uh, prayer teams, and receive prayer for healing. Yes. Uh, that might just be a very simple thing that you, you, know, you could begin to do. Another thing, you might just say, um, once a quarter, we're going to have a healing service. For, mm. you, so folks begin to know, oh, that's the time you can go. And so you, you, you can do things like that. I think another thing I would do if I were in leadership is I would pray and ask the Lord to begin to uh, help me identify the folks in the congregation or the context that have some healing gifts. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are healing gifts of the spirit. There are spiritual gifts that uh, go along, you might just say, that are related to healing. And I would want to see if, if, if we could begin to identify who the folks are, you know, I mean, if, if I even ask myself, well, who would be the people that would be in those prayer teams to pray for people? I, I would think of some people probably right off the top of my head in my congregation and maybe not someone else. Mm-hmm. I might yeah. want to actually be the person that's, uh, you know, administrating something, you know, or uh, that are, is in the financial end of the church or something, fine, you know, you get people, but I'd want to say, Lord, would you begin to draw those people, you know, begin to call those people out, and uh, uh, I might even te- te- do a, 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 a book study, a, a course or something, or preach some sermons on healing, and those things would probably begin to help you identify who the folks are that are are drawn. And then, then what I would do is I would begin to equip those people. I'd have some simple training sessions on, you know, how to basic rudimentary kinds of things in terms of how to pray for people, uh, you know, who have healing needs. And uh, there's a nice, easy sort of five-step model for healing that actually goes back to John Wimber, but has become almost, uh, well, it's all over the body of Christ, you know, it's mm-hmm. a, but it's a helpful, simple way. And there's just some practical things, you know, and and my book actually is partly to help folks that are in healing ministry to gain some a theological framework for 
for healing ministry. But um, those are some of the things I would begin to do if I were uh, in leadership, sensing that the Lord wants to do some healing work here. Now, a lot of churches have ministries like Celebrate Recovery. Right. And that right. actually engages in a lot of healing kinds of ministry, uh, particularly with people with various kinds of addictions, you know. Yes. But that's another kind of thing one could do uh, if one wanted to emphasize healing, I think. Uh, so those are just a few things I just... Oh, that's remember. great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that people... I think there's a very... It's not a very intimidating process that you just laid out there. You know, first to pray about it, to right. seek it out. I'll say, you know, from, from, from my experience, I'm so thankful that I was challenged to do this a, you know, a decade or so into full-time ministry. Actually, Steve Elliott's book, I think that you wrote, a, you know, endorsement for it, like By right. Signs and Wonders. Um, and I uh, finally, I woke up to say, and, and here's, here's my challenge to pastors. If you're kind of worried, well, Andy, you don't know, I have this congregation that's a little bit more, um, they, they, they wouldn't be welcoming this idea. I'm, I was surprised at how ready people were to receive healing prayer. And then also how much I love to do it, <laughs> how much I love to, to pray for people. I mean, and, and you realize in that moment when somebody is sharing with you, whatever it is, um, the, the beauty of the, of the opportunity to connect with people. And as a pastor and, and as a professor too, like, you know, when you get to engage students in a certain way, man, this is why I'm here. You just realize that this, these are the moments that you were made for. Yeah, it's, and you know, I've found over the years uh, when I've gone in uh, to local churches that have maybe never had a healing service uh, or, or, or no one can remember if they ever did and just said, well, tonight, you know, we're going to have a, a, a healing service. I tell you, folks are not bashful. Uh, when, when it comes to coming forward to receive prayer for healing needs, mm. they, they, and, and like you said, I think it's a wonderful way to express God's love for people mm. when they come forward. And, you know, we pray for people. We don't, we're not, I like to say, I'm not in, in management. I'm in sales when it comes to <laughs> healing. I don't know how God's going to heal this person. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just want them to experience God's love for them. And so, like you said, this is what I I was made for as a leader. I want to do these kinds of things because you're you're hitting people at a point of where they really feel a deep sense of need. Mm. You know? Yeah, I think you'd be surprised if you will just do it. Uh, even though you're a little skittish and uh, afraid, uh, folks will come. Yeah, they want to receive prayer for healing. And and, and you know we're we're asked to do this. This is something that yeah we 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 want to obey uh, and follow Jesus, follow the healer. Um, yeah, we're asked to pray for people who are sick. So let's and and, and pray. We're given instructions in in uh, James five as well. So. Right. Um, and you just mentioned something too. I want to follow up on. Uh, you said that you're wanting to give a little more theological foundations for folks who are in, in healing and ministry. What? Tell me about that. Like, what are some of the areas that you feel, feel like this book makes up for that's missing in some of those healing areas? Well, I think, for example, it's really important to understand the relationship uh, in the ministry of Jesus between healing and the kingdom of God. Okay. And so that, that concept, because, you know, his healing miracles, in addition to his proclaiming, you know, the time has come, uh, the, the, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is, is now, it's near, uh, repent, believe in the good news. That was his message, right? Uh but his healing miracles were the, you might just say, the demonstration that what he said really was true, hmm. that the kingdom was here. And what that meant was that, the, in a sense, the, the new age is, has invaded, the new creation has invaded old creation. The future 
what what, what we expected to see at the very end of time is happening now. Um, so that's important to understand. But then it's important to also understand, as Jesus taught about the kingdom, he talked about the mystery of the kingdom that, um, and this is where he kind of messed with the Jewish timeline that the disciples were used to. They were expecting it all to happen kind of at the very end. The kingdom would come, you know, but Jesus is saying, well, it has come, but it's also got to come. Yeah. It's here, but it's not yet here. So it's already not yet. And that already not yet sort of come, uh, 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 understanding of the kingdom is very important to understand in healing ministry because uh, some people want it to be all not yet. Right. So, well, that's not for now. That's for not yet. That's for heaven. That's for. Yeah. And then there's others that want it to be all already. Right. Right. It's all, no, it's all right now. And and then that kind of leads to I, uh, ideas that. So if you don't get healed when you ask to be or ask to receive prayer for healing, then maybe it's because you didn't have enough faith, or maybe it's because right. one person prayed for you, or maybe you didn't pray long enough. But the bottom line is the problem's on your end because it's yes. already it should happen. Well, actually, Jesus' teaching of the kingdom is no, it's both already and not yet, and so that puts us in a uh, an uncomfortable place as it were when we're in healing ministry because a lot of times we don't know which is going to be already and what's not yet and what's maybe it's a combination of the two yeah you know? and yeah, uh, that's helpful see, that I... theological framework really helps me uh not to get led to either extreme but to live in the uh gordon fee called it the radical middle hmm. uh, but it's uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. The, um, going back to those foundational pieces, I think it's helpful. Like in some people might say, oh yeah, I've heard that already. Not yet. But really like often if we think back to these foundational, almost like the grammar of the kingdom can help us to think about the way that we're, we might be missing points. I think like the same thing is true. Like even just going back to the, the grammar of the language of what our ministry is, what it, what we're entering the ministry of Jesus. Um, what is a sermon? Like what a sermon is a place where various um, uh, congregations, a text, a preacher, and an occasion come together. I mean, well, what is healing? This is a place where there's this tension between the already and not yet. So I, I appreciate that focus. Well, see, the, the thing, the thing about that is, Andy, it's like these are foundational things but they have profound practical implications mm. you know and for example if you if you're a preacher and you don't you don't understand that actually your your preaching is an extension of the ongoing pre then you're going to take the burden of that on yourself or yeah. you're going to see it simply as a little talk that you're doing that's that's you know yeah. no you know and and so that's why that's why I felt like that's why I've been teach, teaching theology for a long time, uh, be, because I really believe it's so practical. It, it has such profound implications. Uh, and it's actually very freeing, too, when you get mm. it right. Have you been engaged in, uh, I mean, ever since I've known you, you've been engaged in the emphasizing and teaching about healing. Has this always been a part of the work you feel like God's called you to? Well, you know, my dad wrote a book called Healing for Damaged oh, Emotions. Yeah. That's that's a very that that's been translated into 35 languages. And and so I, I grew up around healing, et cetera, as it were. I was a pastor for 11 years. And I, but actually there was a critical point in my life. I was I, I was about 40 years old. When I really connected, and we were going through some family trials and difficulties raising teenagers, and uh, that rattled my cage. Sounds familiar. It rattled my cage in such a way. God used that actually to get me to kind of get connected to some 
early childhood pain and trauma okay. that went back to when I was growing up in India and sent away to boarding school and and the the separation from parents and and the the loneliness and and some of the things I had done to kind of protect myself from pain. I, I like I describe I had kind of put a coconut shell around my heart, mm. you know. And uh, God used that to that that crisis uh, to rattle my cage and uh, led me uh, with the help of some friends, a Christian counselor, and so forth. And it was like Jesus <laughs> came and, and began to crack that coconut, mm. and opened my heart up in some ways. And it was like, and and, and when I got con and when I was able to finally engage my own suffering, mm. it's it's like it gave me eyes to see the suffering of others. Wow. And, and compassion for the suffering of others. Mm. And then it almost was like seminary students. I'd been teaching really for seven or eight years when this really this happened. Seminary students, uh they seemed to know that I knew. And they started knocking on my door. Oh. And I started, I kind of backed into the ministry of healing prayer and began to learn. And, you know, and so that's really how I would say I really got into this healing ministry thing. Amazing. Yeah. That you, and you've emphasized too, and I know you have a chapter on this. You have another book on uh, the wounds that heal, right? And, um, and that's something. Is is that chapter is a similar type of thrust that you've written about before? Or yeah, what's that the, well, the one chapter in in this book is kind of an attempt to take that wounds that heal book and and condense it down to one chapter. Yeah, you know, bringing our hurts to the cross, right? Because it's through His wounds that we're healed, and uh, there's a lot that we can, uh, yeah. The, well, the cross is at the heart and center of healing. Yeah. Mm. But Steve, I'm so thankful for this book. And I think as people are looking at, at this new moment, I hope they'll go to this. I hope they'll uh, seek it out. And, and, and you're going to be doing some things as well. Um, in rolling this out, I know it might seem self-promotion, like a little too self-promotion-y, but uh, go ahead and tell us like some of the things you're going to be doing in the next couple of months with this book, um, we, I think people might be interested in participating. Yeah, well, um, uh, I'm going to be out at the New Room Conference in Houston, uh, Texas, at the end, toward the end of September, and I'll be doing a, a, a pre-conference uh, workshop on the book and also uh, speaking uh, at the conference about it and so forth. They're highlighting it, and Seedbed, Zondervan's publishing the book, but Seedbed is putting together resources that go with the book. There'll be a course that goes with it, okay. um, which will include, you know, videos based on each chapter and uh, discussion guide and questions and so forth. And, and also uh, even some sermon uh, outlines and guides for pastors that want to preach through it. And they'll be offering it as actually a course and actually folks can use it as a course in local churches and so forth as well. Uh, so those are some of the yeah. things that are going to be happening. Uh, in addition to me doing some podcasts like this and just letting people know that, it, that it's out there. That's great. Well, I'm so thankful that they're emphasizing this and that you're, you know, that God led you to not just have this ministry, but to write about it and help others of us to, to find ways to incorporate this and to teach on it as well. So do you have any other projects coming up? I know you might not want to think about them right now. You're getting this book uh, across the finish line, but I can't help but be interested if there's something else cooking. Well, uh, I uh, there's something cooking, but I'm really not ready to even okay. uh, talk much about it. I I just want to get, get through this season, <laughs> you know, uh, for the next few months. Uh, it's it's been a long time coming. Um, yeah, uh, and I, I'm I'm just excited because I really believe that this book is for the church right now. Yes, and, uh, I pray and hope that 
uh, the Lord Jesus will use it to encourage his body to join him in what he's doing and what his healing ministry. Amen. Well, I, I often ask the question, uh, is there more to the story for somebody? Like, so I'm not, I'm looking to see, like, maybe there's something you won't talk about on another podcast. Maybe there's a hobby or something that you have. So is there more to the story of Steve Siemens? Well, I think so. I, uh, well, we can talk about that. Okay. And figure, and figure something out, but, uh, yeah, uh, is something with grandkids that you like to do, or is there something like that that is a, a part of your life you don't talk about very often? You could share. Yeah, with your we, audience. yeah, yeah. I I like to play pickleball with my grandkids. I okay. used to be a good, a good racquetball player in my day, you know, and uh, uh, so now I've picked up pickleball. And uh, we we had a, a family vacation recently, and we just had a ball because I could play, and my kids. And I've, my grandkids now are most are mostly in high school and college. So uh, we just had a ball, a time uh, the ball, you know. Yeah. So that's a that's a lot of fun for me, you know. Uh, but I'm slowing down, and uh, I, I I exercise and walk, et cetera. To, but um, I'm trying to I'm trying to learn how to live within the limits, you know, it's, it's somebody said to me recently, and I think it's just really true when you get to be in your, I'm in my mid seventies and it's no longer so much about time management as it is energy management. Okay. <laughs> so you, uh, you gotta, you gotta do it when you've got energy and, and then you hit a wall sometimes and there's just nothing left in the tank and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to press, that. I'm going to take, take this vi that video and I'm going to keep it for a later time. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, I can remember. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for this, for writing this book and for your, you know, regular just writing and teaching ministry, Steve. Of course, it has meant a lot to me and, and just to be friends with you through these years and the, the ways you prayed and supported me so, so many souls. Th thanks again for coming on the podcast.